Good morning. My name is Tommy Allen. I'm the lead pastor of New Hope Presbyterian Church in Kent, Washington, and we are glad you are here. This morning, we are going to be talking about, I think, our 30th sermon in the series on the Jesus Storybook Bible, and it's about Jesus calming the storm, called Captain of the Storm from Mark chapter 4. Before we do that, I thought I would lead us through a confession of sin. If you want to find that confession of sin, you can look to the description below and follow along. And it's in unison. So let us pray together. Merciful Father, forgive our sins, the sins of our present and the sins of our past, the sins of our souls and the sins of our bodies, the sins which we have done to please ourselves and the sins which we have done to please others. Forgive them, O Lord, forgive them all. Of your great mercy and bountiful goodness, let us be delivered from the bonds of our frailty. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, in person, I would ask you to take a moment to confess your sins silently, but since we are not in person, I will simply grant you an assurance of pardon that if you have trusted in Jesus to forgive your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive them, and he takes them and casts them as far as the east is from the west, and he will never hold them against you. And so know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen and amen. Okay, one announcement, it's not really an announcement, but we had a congregational meeting last week and it was great. I mean, it, it was flawless. Now, I don't know how you experienced it, but thank you for showing up. I think um, at least 58 different people showed up or at least devices and you know, families. So thank you for that. Now, with all of that said, let us go ahead and jump in to our text this morning from Mark chapter four. Starting at verse 35, it says this. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, rebuked the wind and the sea, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that as we enter into this text, we would be, uh, as the disciples, we would on one hand recognize storms, on the other hand recognize that you are with us in the storm, but also recognize um, the, the magnitude of Jesus himself. I pray that you would open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf. pray that you'd be in my head and in my thinking and in my heart and in my understanding and in my mouth and in my speaking. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen. All right. So let's start with this question. Um, have you ever been in a situation that was so out of control physically? I mean, just like you were just out of control and you didn't know what to do. The only option that you had to do was pray. Me personally, I've been in that kind of situation more times than I can count. Most recently um, was a few years ago. My wife leads a trip. She used to work for Seattle Christian. She leads a, a hiking trip in Catalina Island in California, backpacking for a week. And she asked me to go along as a male chaperone. I agreed. What could possibly go wrong? Well, when we get to, to LA and we go to, to the ferry or this boat that they had hired to take us, the, the captain of the boat said, wow, these are like some pretty bad seas. I might have to take you around the back of the island, you know, and, and you might have to go a different route for your whole trip. And there was, I don't know, 12 or 15 kids with us. And so we go out on, we're crossing from, from Long Beach to Catalina Island, and there were waves like I have never experienced in my life. I'm from South Florida. I spent my life on boats. These boys, this boat was probably about 30 or 40 or 50 feet long, and I remember looking out the window one time, and there were, the, all I saw was a wall of water. Now, I didn't really have time to be afraid because I was part of a, a, a line that was actually handing bags of vomit from one person to the next. There were three of us that weren't sick. 
Lots of the kids were puking all over the place, and I, I didn't throw up. Now, the only reason I didn't throw up because it was a pride thing. I felt like throwing up the whole time. But there was nothing we could do while we were out on those seas. And we finally got to the other side. You know, it's like, okay, now here we are at Kong Island. What are we going to do? Anyhow, the point is this. Today, we're going to look at a, a text about a group of fishermen who experienced a storm, the likes of which they had never experienced. And it was so bad, they feared for their lives. I didn't fear for my life. I was just sort of like, get me out of this thing. I can't do anything here. And I'm tired of like, you know, it was getting a little smelly, if you know what I'm saying. So th these fishermen are in a storm that makes them fear for, them lives, that, for their lives. And then something happens that makes them even more afraid. <laughs> Think about that. So three things we're gonna look at this morning. We're gonna look at a terrible storm, we're going to look at terrified sailors and a surprising savior. So terrible storm, terrified sailors, and a surprising savior. So first, terrible storm. Notice verse 35, it says this. It says, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with them. So the context here is Jesus, at least in the way that Mark presents it in his gospel, I've, he has healed a man and forgiven his sins. He has taught them some parables. He'd been teaching all day. And he was probably actually on the Sea of Galilee, standing in a boat, teaching people that way, like all day. So that why would you stand in a boat on the water? Because sound carries better over the water. And so he had been teaching all day and he was ready to go. He tells the disciples, let's go to the other side. Now, remember on the other side, that's the, the Gerasenes where he will meet the Gerasene demoniac and they will ask him to actually politely leave. They don't want him over there. But nonetheless, Jesus goes with them. It says, on that day when evening come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side, leaving the crowd. They took, took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with them. So there are two things I want you to to remember here. One is that it was evening. I think we see paintings all the time and we see pictures and we assume it was like in the middle of the day and things got dark. It's one thing to experience a horrible storm in broad daylight. It's another thing to experience a horrible storm when it is pitch black outside. And so the other thing also is notice that there were other boats with them. We don't hear about those other boats very often. I'm going to bring them up at the very end. But it wasn't just Jesus and the disciples who experienced this greatest storm ever. It's probably the, the greatest storm in a generation. Um, you see, in, in this, on the Sea of Galilee, apparently, it isn't uncommon to have storms and a lot of wind because it's surrounded by mountains on the north and the east and the west, and cold air rolls down from the mountains, and hot air, it, it hits hot air on the sea, and then that just causes wind and lots of turbulence. And yet, we know that this storm had to be the worst, at least in a generation. How do we know that? And the reason we know it is because the disciples were terrified. At least four of the disciples that we know of, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, um, were sailors. They were, they were fishermen. They were, they'd made their living on the Sea of Galilee. There's probably nothing they hadn't seen. There might have been two other fishermen. And they were horrified. They didn't know what to do. And I'm guessing the other people like Matthew and, and the, uh, Simon the Zealot, they, they were probably just throwing up or something, honestly. But the, even the ones who knew what was going on were terrified. You know, the boats were probably about 20 feet long, maybe seven or eight feet wide, four feet deep. They weren't huge boats. And during that whole time, it says in verse 37, a great windstorm arose, so the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was filling. So the fishermen are horrified. They don't know what to do. You can assume they're bailing like crazy. And verse 38 says, but he, Jesus, was in the stern asleep on a cushion. Worst storm of all time. And Jesus is asleep in the stern. Now, I was in the army, not the Navy. So forgive me if I get this wrong. I think the stern is at the back. And that's, in those days, that's where the captain would sit. So Jesus is in the seat where the captain would sit, and he's sleeping at the wheel. He's fast asleep. He had to be completely out to be able to sleep through that kind of turbulence and that kind of storm. Now, why is he sleeping? Or how is he sleeping? 
let's talk about Halford. How is he sleeping? How, how is he pulling that off? Well, he's probably just bone tired, right? He teaches all day long, every day. People constantly want something from him, and he's just tired. If you've ever been in the military, you know you could sleep anywhere. So that's one hand. On one hand, he is just bone tired, I'm guessing. On the other hand, he's probably leading by example. What do I mean by that? How is Jesus leading by example there? Well, Jesus knew more than anybody that nothing could harm him until he accomplished his mission. Nothing. And if he knew nothing could harm him until he accomplished his mission, then he didn't have anything to worry about no matter how big the storm got. Now, he knew exactly what his mission was. His mission was to be crucified on behalf of certain sinners so that they could be saved from their sins. In other words, he knew his death would be by crucifixion, not by drowning. And so as bad as the storm got, he was going to probably be okay. And here's the thing. The same is true for us. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, I think it was Charles Wesley who said this. He said that until my work on earth here is done... I am immortal. Think about that. Until God is finished with you on the earth, you are immortal. And if you knew you were immortal until God was finished with you, would that change the way you lived your life? Would that help you to chill out a little bit? Would it, would it mean you could actually give up control sometimes? I think it should. I mean, basically, if, if that's true, if we are immortal until God is finished with us, which I believe is true, then we don't need to fear anything. We don't need to fear the storms in our life. We don't need to fear COVID. We don't need to fear politicians. We don't need to fear anything. And yet, people are walking around all the time completely and utterly in fear. I mean, like in the past few years, anxiety is through the roof, especially with college students and teenagers. Right? We have, a, in our society, we have a tremendous problem with anxiety and with fear. If you haven't listened to Samuel's uh, sermon from last week, it was all about anxiety. It was great. Um, but the same thing is happening here. There is anxiety going on here. Um, and basically, to the extent that, that we learn and understand and, and practice letting go and letting God, forgive me for that cliche, um, is the extent we'll be able to sleep in the middle of the storm. It's the extent to which we can be free to preach the gospel. You know, in 2005, a mentor of mine, a great friend, um, was preaching a sermon. He was 69 years old, named Jack Arnold, preaching a sermon. And he was preaching about heaven and basically said this quote. He said, you know, until God is finished with me, I am immortal. And then, bam, he dropped dead in the pulpit. But you know what? Every minute up until that point, he was full on we can be full on as well. You see, the, to, to the extent we were able to let go, let, let go and let God um, is the extent to which we'll be able to sleep. The disciples are getting ready to learn that. Right? On one hand, we laugh at the disciples all the time. On the other hand, it's like, how were they supposed to know that Jesus could control the weather? I actually have sympathy for them. So you go from a terrified storm to terrified sailors. Notice in verse 38, again, it says, But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now think about that question they asked him. That question is really not a question at all. It's a statement that he's like sleeping on the job or that he doesn't care or, or that, that it's an accusation that he has somehow failed. Don't you care that we are perishing? There's two things to notice here. Um, the first is this, is that Jesus in this particular verse reminds me of like a young mother. And what do I mean by that? Is if you've ever met a young, exhausted mother of young children, and she finally falls asleep, there is nothing that can wake her up. Nothing. Except when one of her babies cries. One of her babies cries, boom, she's up. So here's Jesus in the middle of this horrible storm being, you know, everything's being thrown around. People are probably screaming. People are probably crying out. People are doing all these things sleeping. And yet when it says they woke him, 
and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? When one of his disciples whom he loves goes to wake him, when, when they call out for help, he is right there, just like a mother. The other thing to notice is it's ambiguous as what they're asking here in a sense, because when they say, um, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? By that, do they mean, do you not care that we, that is, the disciples and yourself, like all of us in this boat, do you not care if we are perishing? Or do you th care that we are perishing? As if he could do something about it. In, in, in other words, um, what did they expect of Jesus? If they didn't know what to expect, then what are they doing here? And I think what they're actually doing is that their, their complaint is really, um, what they're doing here, it is just a complaint, and it's just a complaint born of anxiety. They don't know what to do with their anxiety, and they really don't know Jesus well enough to know that he can help them with it. And so what they're trying to do is basically get rid of their anxiety by pushing it on him. Now, you know, a psychologist named Edwin Freeman wrote a book called um, Failure of Nerves several years ago. It's a very good book. And basically, he likens anxiety to a virus. And a virus always wants to be caught. And a virus is always about being transmitted, as we well know in the context of COVID. So if anxiety is a virus and all the disciples have it now, there's only one person on the boat that doesn't have it, we better give it to him. And so they wake Jesus up and they're like, hey, here's some anxiety for you. Now, Friedman also says that the remedy to anxiety, at least in these group settings, is a strong, non-anxious presence. And in other words, like if you want to vaccinate against the virus of anxiety, someone in the room has to be a non-anxious presence. And Jesus is going to provide that for the disciples and then some. That not only is he going to be the strong non-anxious presence, but he is going to rid them of their source of anxiety immediately. And so notice verse 39 says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said to the sea, Peace. Be still, and the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Now, notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't wake up and say, Oh, wow, what's going on? Peter, give me a sit rep. You know, Peter would be like, Well, I got James and Andrew down there bailing. Matthew's puking over the side of the boat, and Simon the Zealot, I don't know where he is. I hope he's still. He didn't do anything. He didn't ask him. Peter didn't talk. They woke him up. Jesus woke up, assessed the situation, and simply spoke. Jesus pulled a Yosemite Sam on the Sea of Galilee. What do I mean by that? You know, when I was a kid, I used to love, I still love, and still watch Looney Tunes. And one of my favorite characters was Yosemite Sam. And in every episode, there was usually some part where it was either a horse or a camel, where he'd be riding it, and he would say, Whoa, camel! Whoa, camel! And then he would get frustrated, and he would jump off the camel, and he'd walk around the front, and he'd pop it on the head and say, When I say whoa... I mean, whoa. Jesus started there. In some sense, that's exactly what he did. What Jesus said here, it literally in the Greek, is be still and stay still. And, and it's also interesting that Jesus uses the same kind of language here um, that is used when he casts out demons and things like that. And I think Mark is trying to make a point. And the point is that Jesus has just done something that only God should be able to do, right? God parted the Red Sea for Moses. God um, calmed the sea when Jonah was tossed in it. Um, God, God parted the Jordan. God's the one who can like control the elements, and yet Jesus just did it. Now, but mind you, it's one thing if you're a disciple, Think if you think through them, where they're, they're, they're like, okay, this guy's cool, and they see him heal somebody and say, well, that's cool. I've seen people heal people, you know, on television, you know, but he seems legit. He forgives a guy, and people are like, who do you think you are that you can forgive someone? And all that, so all those kind of things, in some ways, um, a charlatan might have faked. This, he could not. In, in other words, I love watching magicians like David Blaine, because on one hand, I'm like, Wow, mind-boggling. On the other hand, there's part of me behind going, yeah, I know there's some kind of trick behind this. And who knows if they thought that about Jesus up to this point. 
what they thought about him. But at this point, they realize not only is he legit, but he is he, he's more than legit. He, he is doing things only God himself can do. And at that point, I think they start to get it because they are still afraid. Notice the surprising Savior. Verse 40, it says, He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, that when it says they were filled with great fear, it, it says they were ex- filled, exceedingly filled with great fear. In other words, it, their fear could not have gotten worse. Now, this isn't anxiety. This is just like, skirt, right? They are scared. And notice in verse 40, Jesus doesn't say, why were you afraid? He isn't rebuking them. He didn't say, oh, you should, you should have just trusted me in the, with the storms of life. He doesn't say, why were you afraid? He says, why are you afraid? And he says, have you still no faith? In other words, up to this point, they'd seen Jesus do things. And I guess the expectation was that they would start to believe and they would start to understand like, wow, he's, he's pretty, pretty interesting guy. He, he could possibly be the savior, but they didn't have any idea. And again, I sympathize that he was actually God himself. And seeing what Jesus has just done, they are completely and utterly afraid. Now, the interesting thing is that the answer to question number two depends on how you, or the the answer to question number one depends on how you answer question number two. You see, Jesus is asking the question now. And so when he says, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? It's implicit there that faith would be the remedy to their fear. And in fact, I think that's the case. The remedy to our fear is faith. In fact, anytime we, we live in a state of fear, in some ways we're saying to God, don't you know what's happening to me right now? Don't you care what's happening to me right now? What Jesus has just demonstrated is that he not only knows and not only does he care, but he has the power to do something about it. And the same is true with you, with you and me, right? So you and I, we have fear about uh, our job, or we have fear about our family, or fear about um, civil unrest, any number of these things. And our fear basically says, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you know what's going on here? And Jesus is always, I know and I care. And if you don't believe that, look to the cross. Because what we see at the cross is that Jesus knows our dilemma, that we are sinful and separated from God, and there is no amount of work in the world that could restore us on one hand. And he cares. He actually loved us so much that he became the propitiation or the the substitute for us on the cross. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. And when he rose from the dead, we rise with him. And so with all of that, said. You also have to understand the disciples were afraid because suddenly, what would you think if you were suddenly realized you were on a very small boat with God? I'm going to give that one to them. Now, what they didn't understand yet is that basically the fact that God became man in the person of Jesus was not because he was indifferent to their suffering, but because he would bear their suffering. Not because he was indifferent to their lot in life, but he would bear their lot in life. Not that he was indifferent to their storms, but he would actually go through their storms with them. And now here's what's interesting. You know who knew less than the disciples and were probably less afraid than the disciples? It was the people on the other boat. Remember I said I was going to bring them up. The people on the other boats. So imagine you're in the boat with Jesus and all the storms happening. It's going crazy. And Jesus says, peace be still. And you're like, wow, he just did that. Now imagine you're on one of the other boats and you're going equal, you're equally as fearful and you're equally uh, as worried and you pull out some little wooden idol and you start praying to this little wooden idol, please save us, please save us, please save us. And suddenly everything stops. What do you think? You think, oh, it worked. (laughs) This idol worked. But the fact is, is they were blind to the reality that the good that had happened in their life was actually from Jesus and not because of the prayers, the pagan gods, not anything. And that's the case with us today, that, that no matter whether you acknowledge it or not, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, that any good thing we have comes from Jesus himself. And so the question is, will you put your faith in him finally for your salvation? And if you have, would you not fear as much because you know he cares and you know that he knows? 
So let me do this. Let me finish with the, the Jesus Storybook Bible, the way they portray this. I love this, the way, what they did here. And so this is on page 242, by the way, if you're following along. The way they say it, it says, the wind and the waves recognized Jesus' voice. They had heard it before, of course. It was the same voice that made them in the very beginning. They listened to Jesus and they did what he said. Immediately, the wind stopped. The water calmed down. It glittered innocently in the moonlight and lapped quietly against the side of the boat as if nothing had happened. The little boat bobbed gently up and down. There was a deep stillness and a great quiet all around. When Jesus turned to his wind-torn friends, why were you scared? He asked, did you forget who I am? Did you believe your fears instead of me? Jesus' friends were quiet, as quiet as the wind and the waves. <laughs> and into their hearts came a different kind of storm. What kind of man is this? They asked themselves anxiously. Even the winds and the waves obey him, they said, because they didn't understand. They didn't realize yet that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus' friends had been so afraid that they had only seen the big waves. They'd forgotten that if Jesus was with them, then they had nothing to be afraid of, no matter how small their boat or how big their storm. Let me pray for us. Father, I do thank you for this text. I thank you that this story has been recorded for us, that it's more than the fact that you'll deliver us from the storms, but that you'll be in the storms with us, and that Jesus, you, very God of very God, were willing to condescend to become one of us, that you might take our sins from us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Well, at this point in the service, I used to say that we would have an offertory and the doxology and all that stuff. We are meeting in person right now, um, and we are not doing an offertory because of the COVID restrictions. We are just doing a musical meditation, and we have a big box in the back of the church for people to put offerings in if they want to do things that way, or you can give online. The information is in the description below. And if you have been giving, thank you so much. So we've, we've done great in 2020, and we're doing great so far this year. Thank you for that. So I thought I'd end our time with the same profession of faith that we're using in worship. It has to do with communion. Now, if you want to take communion, you should be in church, frankly. But I thought this would be helpful anyway because of people who have doubts and who have fears. And so let me read you the question and the answer. So the question is from the larger catechism, question 172. And the, that question says this. Should those who have doubts about their being in Christ or about whether they are ready to take communion come to the Lord's Supper anyway? Answer, those who have doubts about their position in Christ or about their readiness to take communion may nonetheless have a valid interest in Christ even though they are not yet assured of being in Him. In God's view, if such people are aware of and grieved by their lack of assurance, sincerely want to be found in Christ and want to get away from sinning, and since promises are involved in the sacrament and it has been established to aid even weak and doubting Christians, if people in that condition are truly sorry for their lack of faith and work hard to resolve their doubts, they may and ought to come to the Lord's Supper so that their faith may be further strengthened. Amen. So let me send you from this virtual place reminding you that the Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God is a mighty and victorious warrior. The Lord your God is, will quiet you with his love and the Lord your God shouts over you with great shouts of joy. Leave this virtual place in the peace and hope and joy of that knowledge. Have a great week. Pastor Tommy, out.